All right, let's talk about Texas for a while. It, uh, at the beginning of our story here, Texas, or as Mexico viewed it, it was pronounced Tejas. It was a state of, uh, of Mexico. And this star area is roughly where the earliest settlers were moving in. If we look at this map, you can plainly see where the most rainfall is. Check a look at your key over there on the left. Uh, the gr darker the green, the more rain. The darker the red, the least amount of rain. And these Gulf Coastal Plains here were extremely popular. Many people from the United States were moving into this region. Uh, well, why were they allowing these settlers to move in anyway? Mexico did not have enough people to populate that whole area. Most of Mexico's citizens live closer to modern Mexico, Mexico City. And the uh, Native Americans in that area are raiding and Mexico can't control it. So they invite some settlers to come in. They ask for Catholic settlers because Catholicism was the main religion in Mexico. They thought uh, that would join their peoples together with common faith. Uh, they might be able to, uh, or they want to encourage people to obey Mexican law, speak Spanish, learn Spanish, and just essentially invite these people to join their country beginning in 1821. It doesn't happen that quickly, though. Uh, most Americans coming to Texas are really there for land. They're not super interested in not being American anymore. Many of them are not super interested in Catholicism, and many of them are coming from other parts of the world, like Germans and they don't speak English or Spanish, so it's even more complicated and messy. And as these people move into the area, they're not really respecting Spanish law either. Uh, they, uh, for example, slavery was outlawed in Mexico. So in Texas, slavery was illegal. But people continued practicing uh, slavery and bringing slaves into Texas. So a couple things happened in quick succession in the 1830s. First off, Santa Ana, the guy on the left there, becomes dictator of Mexico. And you got to remember that Americans remember their grandparents throwing off the king of England to uh, have a free and democratic society and be able to vote and choose their leaders for them. So now they've gone from a country where they felt like they were participating in the government to where they are subjected to a dictator. This is not going to make them happy. Stephen Austin uh, and many others, Texans favor independence. And keep in mind, these Texans talking about independence were not just the European-American settlers who came from the United States. There were many uh, Tejanos, which were Spanish uh, or Mexican Texans who also favored independence or, or resisting Santa Ana. And these Tejanos will be fighting in the battles with the Texan army. Uh, Sam Houston, the guy on the right, he is the one who became the commander of the Army of Texas that we read about in chapters 1 and 2 of Which Way to the Wild West. So the Texas War for Independence is mostly in 1836. It is a much shorter affair than the American Revolutionary War. Uh, the Texans capture San Antonio and about 180 Texans fortify themselves in an old church. Uh, it's called a mission at, known as the Alamo. Now, the Mexican army surrounds them and bombard and harass for 13 days, and finally they decide they're going to attack and, and kill all the defenders and just be done with it to make an example of them. There's another battle at a place called Goliad where the Mexican army wins again and, and they capture the uh, about 400 Texans, and after the battle's over, they then execute these 400 Texans. So Texas is now outraged. They already didn't like Santa Ana, but the things that Santa Ana is doing is so cruel and getting such a reputation that he's making the re revolution in Texas even more popular. So Santa Ana kind of plays a trick on, excuse me, Sam Houston kind of plays a trick on Santa Ana. Sam starts to run. If you follow the, uh, the map here, you can see they lose in San Antonio, uh, they lose here in Gonzales after the Alamo, of course. At first, this was a battle. Now Houston's on the run. And he's forcing Santa Ana to chase him. But the catch is, the further Santa Ana moves east, the longer Santa Ana's supply trains are. So he has to keep sending people back for supplies. or slowing down, waiting for the wagons to catch up. So he starts leaving troops behind. And by the time they get to San Jacinto, his army is barely larger than the Texas army. And this is where they turn around. 
and Sam Houston leads the attack. And the whole battle only lasts something like 18 minutes before Houston has just routed the Mexican army, captured Santa Ana, and forced Santa Ana to agree to leave Texas and arguably recognize Texas independence. Although this is that was debated between Mexico after the war, you know that they no longer had control of Texas. Whether they recognized its independence or not was, uh, the, anyway, they were not excited about it. I'll leave it at that. So Mexico, as I mentioned a moment ago, views the Republic of Texas as a territory in rebellion. Texas wants to join the U.S., but the U.S. doesn't want to get involved in Texas and Mexico's war and conflict, so they do not bring Texas into the Union. Uh, into the Union, So Texas remains independent for nine years, which is a long time for a state to be in rebellion. So kind of Mexico really knew Texas wasn't part of their country anymore, but there wasn't a whole lot they could do about it. And then nine years later, and we'll talk about this in a, in a minute, and you saw it at the end of, I believe, Chapter 3 with James K. Polk, uh, Texas will be brought into the Union. 